But how many are my foes? How many rise up against me? Many are saying of me, God will not deliver him. But you, are, you Lord, are a shield around me, my glory, the one who lifts my head high. I call out to the Lord, and he answers me from his holy mountain. I lie down and sleep. I wake again because the Lord sustains me. I will not fear, though tens of thousands assail me on every side. Arise, Lord, deliver me, my God. Strike all my enemies on the jaw. Break the teeth of the wicked. From the Lord comes deliverance. May your blessing be on your people. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks, David. Tim Laver is going to preach to us now from the passage. Hi, morning, everybody. And hopefully you can hear me, hear me, Tim. So um, we're in Psalm 3, um, which is titled A Psalm of David When He Fled from His Son Absalom. And of all the uh, Bible characters from the Old Testament, King David's life story is the most suited to a Netflix serialization. And in particular, the story of David and his son Absalom is straight out of a Game of Thrones episode. All the ingredients for a Hollywood blockbuster are there. There's love and lust, there's cheap betrayal, and there's costly loyalty. There's rape, there's incest, there's violence. And amongst the rich cast of characters, you find devoted priests, devious special advisors, and double agents. But Absalom would probably be played by Brad Pitt, because 2 Samuel 14, 25 says, in all Israel, there was not a man so highly praised for his handsome appearance as Absalom. From the top of his head to the sole of his foot, there was no blemish in him. Whenever he cut the hair of his head, he used to cut his hair once a year because it became too heavy for him. He would weigh it and its weight was 200 shekels. And Psalm 3 is David's prayer or song at a critical time in this David Absalom saga. There has been a, cue, a coup. Absalom has made his move and is marching on Jerusalem and David is on the run. And to save the city of Jerusalem from being besieged, David flees along with his men. And David's bed for the night isn't the palace. Instead, just like his early life when he was on the run from Saul, he is sleeping under the stars. But in response, David turns to God in prayer. And that's verses one and two of this psalm. Lord, how many are my foes? How many rise up against me? Many are saying of me, God will not deliver him. And fleeing Jerusalem, he is met by a man called Shimei. And 2 Samuel 16 takes up this story. As King David approached Behorim, a man from the same clan as Saul's family came out from there. His name was Shimei of Gera, and he cursed as he came out. He pelted David and all the king's officials with stones, uh, th though all the troops and the special guard were on David's right hand and left. As he cursed, Shimei said, get out, get out, you murderer, you scoundrel. The Lord has repaid you for all the blood you shed in the household of Saul, in whose place you have reigned. The Lord has given the kingdom into the hands of your son Absalom. You have come to ruin because you are a murderer. Not only was David deserted and betrayed, the charge was God will not help you. And Shimei declares you have brought this on yourself. Live by the sword, David, die by the sword. And in one sense, Shimei was actually right. David had brought this upon himself. David had sinned against God. David, in an abuse of power, had stolen another man's wife. And to cover this up, he had the husband put to death. And the prophet Nathan had come to David and told him that the consequences of this sin would haunt him and his family for the rest of his life. 2 Samuel 11, uh, 12, 11 says, this is what the Lord says. Out of your own household, I'm going to bring calamity on you. 
before your very eyes, I will take your wives and give them to one who is close to you. And he will sleep with your wives in broad daylight. You did it in secret, but I would do this thing in broad daylight before all Israel. And this is actually what happens in this story. This was God's punishment playing out in David's life. And no doubt David himself felt that keenly. To the crushing weight of a fractured family and a fractured nation is added the reality that he knows that it was his sin. It was his moral failure that had led to this moment. And I suspect he had that nagging thought, am I abandoned by God? Have I blown it? <clears throat> the pain of regret and remorse is added to all David's other troubles. But he prays. And I think this is often true of us. Often in our lives, there's an enemy on our shoulder saying, there's no help for you in God. You've blown it. And there's an old hymn. It's an old hymn revived by a new tune that goes like this. When Satan tempts me to despair and tells me of the guilt within, upward I look and see him there who made an end of all my sin. Because the sinless saviour died, my sinful soul is counted free. For God the just is satisfied to look on him and pardon me. If you think you have blown it, don't despair. If you think your past is irredeemable, look up. God's grace massively outnumbered all the wrong in David's life. And it can in our lives too. Thanks to God's amazing grace in Jesus, the slate can be wiped clean and we can begin again. And so David does look up. Verses three and four. But you, Lord, are a shield around me. My glory, the one who lifts my head high. I call out to the Lord and he answers me from his holy mountain. David doesn't just pray, he trusts. David's confidence, his identity, his self-esteem are found not in being a dad. He was hopeless at that. He, not in being a leader, he'd been a failure there as well. Nor in the trappings and the status of being a king. His confidence, his identity are in the fact that the Lord is a shield around him. And his glory, his self-esteem, everything that he is, comes from him. And how does God answer his prayer? Look at verses five and six. I lie down and sleep. I wake again because the Lord sustains me. I will not fear, though tens of thousands assail me on every side. God gives him a good night's sleep. In one sense, it's so boring and yet so amazing. Facing a coup by his own son. Facing death, David lays down and sleeps. I'm not a great sleeper. And for me, a big part of the reason I'm not a great sleeper is because I'm a very good warrior. And a philosopher once said quite a profound thing. Man is the animal who cannot sleep. And if ever David should have had a broken night, it was this night. But such was his confidence in God and such was God's care for him that he slept and woke refreshed. And isn't that just how God often gets us through difficult situations? He gives us tiny answers to our prayers, just enough for us to get to the next day, the next stage. For David, it was the gift of sleep. We really want to know we're not alone going to that appointment, that interview, that, that meeting, whatever it might be. And God answers with, I don't know, a text from a friend, a parking space available at just the right time at the hospital, a verse in our morning reading, a call from the agent, whatever it is. God answers with this seemingly trivial thing, but we know then we're not alone. First is the problem. A good night's sleep, a parking space is utterly insignificant, but it can be that assurance that we need. Then David prays for victory. He prays for a knockout blow to land on his enemies but David this must have hurt to pray this prayer because it was for the defeat of his own son verse 7 arise Lord deliver me my God strike all my enemies on the jaw break the teeth of the wicked spoiler alert if you don't want to ruin the Netflix serialization when it does come out David does triumph Absalom is defeated and David, as God's rightful king, is restored. 
And David, David is able to declare, from the Lord comes deliverance. May your blessing be on your people. You may be wondering why we read from Matthew 27 at the start. In that chapter, God's anointed King Jesus is surrounded by enemies. He is mocked and cursed. As Tim said, he was faced a barrage of insults. He's driven out of the city to be crucified. And just like David, it was being said of him, God will not deliver him. Jesus, surrounded by rebellion against his authority, cried out to God, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? But he wasn't ultimately forsaken. He lay down and just like David, he slept. For him, it was the sleep of death. But on the third day, as it were, he woke again. He rose again. And Psalm 3, if you read it through the lens of Jesus, you'll see, yes, it's a hymn of rejection, but it's also a, a, a psalm of resurrection. With his resurrection came victory, came deliverance. The Apostle Paul wrote to the Corinthian church, but Christ has indeed been raised from the dead, the first fruits of those who have fallen asleep. For as in Adam all die, so in Christ all will be made alive. For he must reign until he has put all enemies under his feet. The last enemy to be destroyed is death. From the Lord comes deliverance. May your blessing be on your people. Amen.